days prior to the first launch attempt, uh, we live in this building, which is like a dormitory, for those three or four days, practicing our uh, last-minute procedures and uh, getting uh, fully prepared to launch. We launched at night on STS-93 based on the requirements that the Chandra Observatory had uh, for its final orbit. Uh, we stop in the white room on the way inside the orbiter to uh, do some last-minute equipment reconfiguration, and here you see Eileen being strapped into the commander seat. This happens about three hours before launch, and then as you can see, we count down to zero, the engine's light, and off we go. The main engine start is about seven seconds prior to liftoff, and the main engines come up to speed and are checked out uh, to make sure they're good before we lift off. Katie will point out the uh, small hydrogen leak that we had on the right nozzle. Three of about a thousand tubes were ruptured, which were enough to um, cause us a little leak, but not enough to cause a, any sort of failure in the engine or indication that it was failing. The liftoff is quite exciting, a uh, culmination of a lot of hard work by um, a lot of people around NASA. And the acceleration of the shuttle is uh, testimony to that as it clears the tower at about 100 miles an hour. Proceeding on up and uh, passing through the speed of sound nearly vertically at about 18,000 feet, approximately one minute into flight. The booster separated about two minutes. The shuttle continues to accelerate on the main engines to about 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. When the main engines cut off, we're in zero G. We separate the tank and we're orbiting the Earth. About one hour and a half after um, ascent, we open the payload bay door with Steve from uh, inside the cockpit. And that allows us to see uh, Chandra outside and after we scheduled, we conducted the, the power up of uh, Chandra in order to have electricity and uh, heating to the satellite. We deployed the Chandra on day one. And it's not just the Chandra telescope, but also the booster rocket that is attached uh, to one end of the Chandra. You actually can't even see it behind the long silver telescope there. But uh, in back of the telescope is the booster rocket or the inertial upper stage. And much of our day one activities uh, surround trying to check out the inertial upper stage, make sure that it is re uh, completely ready to take Chandra to its final orbit. And uh, when some of the checks are complete, we go ahead and release the payload. And now we're going to actually tilt it up um, from the back of the bay. The, um, the top of the telescope is going to tilt up, up above the nose of the shuttle there. And uh, this is a kind of an interesting shot where you're actually going to see the orbiter cabin reflected in the top end of the telescope. And so uh, Jeff is actually using a camera to look out these windows. And uh, you can see, uh, you can't quite see Jeff filming, but you can see the two orbiter windows there. Now we tilt the telescope up like this so that we can go ahead and check out its lower antenna, make sure that that is functioning. It has an upper antenna as well as we've already checked out. And we also do our final checks at that time before we release its umbilical, um, which is a series of cables and cords which provide power and telemetry from the telescope. And when we're sure that everyone is ready at Mission Control in Sunnyvale for the inertial upper stage, Mission Control in Cambridge for the, uh, for the Chandra, and also Mission Control in Houston for the shuttle, when we're sure that all those folks are ready, then we, uh, I go ahead and pull the switch mark deploy. And you're looking at the deploy of the Chandra X-ray Observatory third in the series of four of the family of the great observatories. It's not something that moves out all that fast. It's about uh, maybe uh, one foot every three seconds or so. Now, Eileen is getting ready to actually back the shuttle away from the Chandra. And we'll actually do a series of maneuvers to um, get away from the Chandra and the inertial upper stage before the inertial upper stage fires uh, the first and then the second of its two solid rocket motors to then take the, Ch the Chandra into its highly elliptical orbit, which is not close to the Earth as we are, but about a third of the way to the moon, so a very large elliptical orbit. And this shows you as the telescope and the inertial upper stage pass uh, by the upper windows there. The Chandra facility was actually named after a very famous astrophysicist who worked uh, in the 20th century and uh, died about four years ago. His name was Subramanian Chandra Sekhar, and that was all very hard for those of us in astronomy to say, but he was known uh, among all of my colleagues as Chandra. And uh, we deployed right before sunset, and this is the actual sun setting on the Chandra as we lost sight of it forever. 
Once the Chandra was deployed, we began to do some of the other experiments. And I showed you that telescope that we were practicing with in the simulator. This is a picture of Venus that we took with that telescope. This is actually one of the only pictures taken of Venus in the ultraviolet. This is a picture of Jupiter and its moons. Jupiter is so bright in this picture that its image is saturated a bit, but the, the little dots you see next to the bright image are the moons of Jupiter. And this is, of course, the Earth's moon. Um, again, uh, ultraviolet lights don't penetrate the Earth's atmosphere well, and so you have to go to space to uh, do this kind of observing, and that's one of the very few images ever taken of the moon in this wavelength. As Steve mentioned, we had 20 other experiments on board besides the Chandra. This is one of several biology experiments where we took uh, plants up to grow plants on orbit. And then I would take uh, sets of those plants every two days and, uh, and dissect them to bring them back to Earth to, uh, for the uh, experimenters to study. These were specially designed plants that had a, des uh, a gene um, designed into them that can actually tell the investigators back home if the plant was feeling stressed while it was on orbit. Stresses would, would include uh, things like lack of ops oxygen, uh, not knowing which way uh, to grow up, things like that. And uh, the, all these kinds of things, and these are some other biology experiments that you see attached to our MINDEC lockers, we're trying to understand how to grow s uh, plants in space, not only so that we can have food sources on our interplanetary missions, but also so that we can understand how plants grow um, more about how they grow so we understand how to grow them here on Earth. And these are some of the other experiments, some of them uh, very uh, intricate single-cell experiments. And these are some caterpillars which turned into butterflies which were studied by school children. And also some technology experiments. These are solar array hinges uh, that we're trying out for new kinds of uh, uh, satellites and uh, things that we'll, we'll try and have solar arrays on. The shuttle has two engines that we use on orbit to raise and lower our orbit. You're going to see a burn here. We go from zero G to a fraction of a G momentarily. Living in space is exercising. You can see uh, one of us running on the treadmill. Uh, we need to exercise every day. If not, you lose your muscle and your bones very quickly. And this treadmill will be on the space station. Eileen is, uh, you see uh, Eileen uh, working with a computer to communicate with the ground. You have email on board, internet, and she's smiling because she received a letter from her husband. And uh, you see the small kitchen on the right. So I was, as a French, I was a cook in the flight. <laughs> so uh, they seem to enjoy. It's also exercising is cleaning. You know, we have a vacuum cleaner, very similar to the one you use every day in your house. And you see Jeff uh, with a cartridge, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a system to reduce your CO2 or dioxide, dioxide of carbon in your shuttle. And uh, Steve is uh, answering to a question asked by children through the computer, also by internet. <laughs> Make some toys as well to, to study the conversion, I mean, the, the momentum of the rotation for small things like that. And Jeff is a Navy pilot, so he wanted uh, to play with water. <laughs> well, the Earth is very beautiful, and it's, it's tremendous to look out the window upon it. But that also is a job of ours. We spend a lot of time observing the Earth. One study we did on our mission was a study of the uh, world's reefs. This is the Great Barrier Reef off of eastern Australia. It turns out that the coral reefs of the world indicate uh, the health of the ocean, so they're being studied very carefully right now, and we're participating in that. These are two of the Society Islands in the South Pacific. We call that one Pork Chop Island. <laughs> a view here of the um, lightning along the Texas Gulf Coast at night, and you can also see the band of atmosphere that surrounds the Earth. Very beautiful up there, but all things must come to an end. Fortunately, our mission ended with an empty tilt table, empty payload bay, and a successful deploy of Chandra. We did a deorbit burn here just before the sunset that you see here on the wing. A deorbit burn over Australia. And it slowed our orbit down enough to come uh, uh, bring the orbiter crashing into the Earth's atmosphere, somewhere between Hawaii and California. As we came across Texas, shown here from the ground in Houston, uh, the orbiter was smashing into the air molecules and breaking them apart, forming a plasma glow and ion trail. Very spectacular from the ground. We're doing about 10,000 miles an hour at 200,000 feet at this point. 
the long-range tracking cameras at Kennedy Space Center in Florida picked us up. This is our heat signature on an infrared camera. You can see how the nose and the wings uh, are very hot. We heat up to over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And in this shot, we're making a right turn to land to the north. This is the actual view that Jeff and I saw out our forward windows. The numbers are on a heads-up display or a HUD. In the background, you see Cocoa Beach and Cocoa as we, uh, again, turn around to the north. You can read out our altitude on the right, our airspeed on the left, and we have guidance uh, diamond in the middle that we follow to uh, keep us on course and glide slope. We're 300 knots at this point, descending down final on a, uh, about seven times higher descent rate than a commercial airliner. In this view, we're passing 2,000 feet. We're doing a pre-flare maneuver to take us to a one degree glide slope. <coughs> and again, this is the picture we saw with the floodlights. Um, we were only the 12th night landing ever. And uh, night landings are a little more difficult. Obviously, you don't have the same depth perception or sense of speed at night. But the lights brought us in. Um, Jeff uh, deployed the landing gear um, at touchdown. He deployed the drag chute. And it was actually quite um, easy landing the shuttle after having trained for many years in the uh, shuttle training aircraft that we maintain uh, to keep the pilot's uh, skills up to actually come in and land. And the, every shuttle mission has been landed manually uh, by the commander versus an auto land. We uh, stopped the orbiter, did about 30 to 40 minutes of reconfiguring to get uh, Columbia ready to turn back to the ground crew. And we got out, did a walk around, uh, met the, the folks at Kennedy Space Center. This is a really special time for us to thank the workers for getting uh, Columbia ready. You'll see a picture here of the right main engine. We had talked about our hydrogen leak, and you'll actually see it here. It was very small, but you can see the, as soon as the folks saw that after we landed, they uh, had a pretty good idea of what had happened. <coughs> 